Michael Gomez, and I'm a real estate broker and an investor here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm Seth Mosley, Grammy award-winning songwriter and real estate investor. We host a monthly meetup in Middle Tennessee for anyone who wants to build passive income, not only for retirement, but for today. On the first Wednesday of every month, we bring in an expert from every area of investing to help you with things like finding deals, getting your financing locked in, asset protection, every kind of investing, so much more. Our videos are all about delivering that content to you. Go to musicandmoneyig.com for more info on our free monthly events. Hit subscribe on the page so you don't miss any awesome content and hit that like button if you like it. Don't let all the fur on my jacket distract you. Here's the content. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> This has been an amazing experience for me so far. I'm coming home. I grew up, uh, the little growing up I did do, I did in Chattanooga. So a couple hours south of you. Um, uh, things were much different back then. Um, it wasn't that great a place to live. <laughs> now Chattanooga is really nice and, and, uh, and Nashville is amazing. You know, I met Seth at a real estate, real estate guys radio summit at sea thing. And... Uh, I was really impressed with Seth, as, as many of you are. Maybe you're not. I don't know. But I don't know. But uh, he's invited me to speak. And I, I get a chance to speak around the country, but not as much anymore. I, I, I was first a little intimidated walking in the room because I didn't see anybody with gray hair, except a little patch on Seth's back of his head. There, there was no gray hair here. Now, thankfully, um, all the gray hairs, I think, sleep in a little bit longer. So you guys started showing up, and you make me feel at home. So I really appreciate it. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to talk about some serious things, but hopefully in not too serious a way. And uh, I want to start off with my story a little bit. And my story is that, is that I'm going to be represented of IRA money, because my story is not much different than many of yours that, that are the same age as mine. And that is, I started out life at Lockheed Missiles and Space Company. You know, you ever heard of that? And it's now called Lockheed Martin. And I remember starting out in this 17,000-person company. Now, I happened to go to school and college in Chattanooga at a little school called Southern Missionary College. Anyone ever heard of it? One person, thank you very much. And we're only two hours away. That's kind of sad. We didn't have much of a football team, and that's probably why. But I went from a small school where I had 250 people graduated with me, um, and I did graduate, yes, with a business degree. And uh, ended up going out to California and started with a 17,000-person firm. Now, the first thing you do when you go into a firm and you're hired is you go through the HR department. So I sat down there, and, and I had never been through this before. And they said, would you like to get involved in a 401k program? I said, what's that? I was 23 years old. And they said, well, that's to save for your retirement. I'm thinking, that's probably a pretty good idea, but I live, I'm living in California. That's real expensive. So what I decided to do is this. I made a deal with myself that I would put 2% of my salary in there, and that every time I got a bonus or a raise, I guess I was optimistic, but 50% uh, of it would go into my retirement. That way I could save without pain, right? Because I'd always be growing. It's a great way, by the way, if, if you can't save money, to make a pledge to start small and keep doing it as you raise your income. And that's what I did. 13 years later, I left Lockheed with about $125,000 in my IRA, now, that was a lot of money, and uh, it was about twice as, twice as much as I was making. And I hated being in the stock market because I felt like I would, I would lose. I was a strategy consultant after that in the telecom industry when cellular... How many people remember when cellular industry was born? What was the cost per minute? Do you remember? No, it's actually started out at about a dollar a minute, and then it started going down after that. We used to have car phones, not mobile phones. Remember? Car phones. And I worked in that industry, and it was a lot of fun, and I got a chance to, to work with most of the wireless and wireline carriers, and I figured I knew their industry better than the average person, so I started taking my, my IRA, because I had rolled it out into Schwab, and investing in these companies I was consulting to. Now, it wasn't inside knowledge. I didn't have inside knowledge like Martha Stewart did, you know. But I made the investments, and I found out I was losing money faster than ever. And it was the fact that I couldn't win in Wall Street. I felt like even though I knew the industry, I couldn't win. It was frustrating. I always liked real estate, like all of you. And I said to myself, I'd have a better chance 
And I remember on one of the trips, I read a magazine in the, that was in the seat pocket in front of me, and it said that I could use my IRA to buy real estate. Now, this was back 20 years ago, and uh, the industry was really not around. So I, I went all, the, all around to the banks in Chicago, where I was living at the time, and I said, can I use my IRA to buy real estate? And every one of them said no, and they said, but we have this great CD program that you might want to do. And it was frustrating to me because I knew I could do it. So I finally found the wealth management group in LaSalle Bank. Anyone ever remember LaSalle Bank? They got gobbled up by Bank of America. And I remember driving, I got an appointment, and the only reason that I qualified, it wasn't because I had the money to qualify, but because my company had a line of credit with their bank and they were going to try to accommodate me. So I remember I went, I, I went in the elevator to the third floor. I'd never realized that there was more than one floor in a bank building because I never got up there. I was always between the ropes, you know, walking like all of us do. And so I remember going to the third floor. There was only four desks in this big area. And all the people were dressed much better than I'd. And there was a young lady who, who welcomed me and sat me down at the desk. What would you like to do? I said, I want to buy real estate with my IRA. I had found a piece of property over, you know where Kiowa Island and Seabrook Island is, just south of Charleston? I had found a lot over there, and I wanted to buy it. And uh, so that's what I asked. And she says, sure, we'll be glad to do that for you. I said, how much is it? She said, a couple thousand dollars to do it and a thousand dollars a year. Within 30 days, I own my first piece of real estate in my IRA. You understand how hard I had to work for it and how much I had to pay for it. But I was walking on air because I felt I had a chance. And I also didn't have to go on my computer and watch my stock positions go from red to green to red to green. Those colors really can be quite unnerving, you know, when you're 30 years old, 33 years old, and, and you watch that come and go. I didn't want to do that anymore, and I loved real estate. So that particular piece of real estate I bought has been the most valuable piece of real estate ever simply because it got me in the business that we're in. So cycle forward, and I'm in the consulting business, and 9-11 happens. Well, when 9-11 happened, people that are old, enough, are old enough to remember in a business sense realized the economy before that happened wasn't really doing well. And that was like the death knell. When that hit, then any kind of personal transportation you needed to do by plane was gone. For about two and a half months, you couldn't travel. And so our business went under. And it, it was really a shame because we had, I had created this really nice severance package for myself with this company. It was one year. So I figured if anything happened to this company, I'd be well taken care of. By then, I had married my sweetheart that I'd met when I was forklift driving at Little Debbie Snack Cakes way back in Collegedale, Tennessee, way back there. Um, we had three kids, and now I'm out of work. So the first thing I say is, let's trim costs, right? So let's move to Florida. So we moved to Orlando, where my wife's family was. I'm reading the Wall Street Journal. And I come across this article about a company that a company called Entrust. And I think somebody here mentioned Entrust's name. And uh, it was a quote from Hugh Brahma, who was the CEO of Entrust, and it says, you know, we provide self-directed IRAs, et cetera. Here's all the things you could do. It was in the personal finance section of the Wall Street Journal. And I said, this is interesting. It's actually a company that does this. So I, I, I think God kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, call this guy. So that day I called him, and he took my call, which is surprising, right? You thought that there'd be a lot of screeners, but for some reason I got through, and, he's, and I said, listen, you're out in California, I'm in Florida, it's got to be real annoying for your clients in the East Coast to wait for you guys to wake up, I didn't quite say it that way, to deal with your clients. How about if you open an office here? I had no idea what it would take to be a self-directed IRA custodian administrator. So he said, well, it's interesting, I'm coming there in 60 days. So I got out my spreadsheet. I love spreadsheets because spreadsheets really get to the truth, don't they? As, as, as much as you know, we like to throw rocks at CPAs, right? Spreadsheets are the way the world is run. So I wanted to try to go figure out how to, how to make the business of it. And I started with 72 variables and I worked it all the way down and I said, there's a viable business. He came in 60 days, we talked about it and God worked in amazing ways. Opened the office about 45 days later. And uh, I had no clients, so my aunt was my first client. I put, the, uh, I put my uh, folios in my car and I drive down to Miami because a lot more people in Miami, a lot more money in Miami than there is in Orlando, and just started building the business one, one bit at a time. Because I felt like people wanted those same kind of choices that I wanted. 
and, uh, but they shouldn't have to pay $2,000 to go do it, and they shouldn't have to beg the bank to go do it. So that's what we've done. Now, 15 years later, we have New View. We've gone independent, and uh, we have about $1.1 billion of clients' money. So I'm kind of here on a client's journey because you understand that most people work in industry, and then they leave that industry, they change jobs. Every time they do that, their 401k, their 403b, their 457, all of this money is now available to them. And people scratch their head and they try to explain what self-directed IRAs are. Well, it's really a piss poor name for what we do. Because if you have an account with Charles Schwab, you get a chance to self-direct it, right? They're not telling you what to do. They might be advising you, but you get the choice. So it's not self-direction. I kind of think of it like, if you want to get a steak, do you go to McDonald's to get a steak? And the answer is no. Why? Can McDonald's legally serve you a steak? Of course they can. And, but they choose not to do it, and that's what Charles Schwab does. A true self-directed IRA is where you have all the choices that the IRS doesn't prohibit. You understand how I put that? The IRS doesn't prohibit it, because the IRS never lists what you can do. They love to list what you can't do. And inside of that, so if you go to their code, you can never see about that you can buy real estate in your IRA. They don't state that you can buy stocks and bonds and mutual funds in your IRA. So you have to kind of understand the rules. So, so when the sense is a self-directed IRA is really giving you all the choices, and most people don't want choice. They say they want choice, but they don't. That's why they stay in the market back there. So the first thing is, is that we're not attorneys or CPAs. Um, I understand there are some really good CPAs here in the room. Um, but, uh, and I've met a couple of them already, go talk to them about investments, investment choices. That's not up to me. I'm sort of here as the practitioner. So if you're in the process of r raising money for a deal, if you want debt, if you want equity participation, if you want partners, best place, easiest place to go, I believe, is other people's IRAs. So when we're talking about this, I want you to think about this for yourself, of course, but also think about it as raising money. I would suggest it's the easiest money you can ever raise out there. Think about IRAs. When do you want the money back? This is participation time. When do you need your IRA back? 65. Uh, many of us don't want it back at all. Because I, I, what I want to do is be able to pass it on to my kids. But I want it to generate the income, right? So maybe what I want to do, and, and I, I think this probably should be everybody's goal, it, it's not to retire... Someone was saying, well, my goal is to make sure that I retire well and that my funeral check bounces, right? So it's going to be like timed perfectly. I would much rather have that money in my account, the same principle, all through my, all through my retirement and either pass that on to my heirs or donate it or maybe a little bit of both. That's what I'm planning on doing. And I think it's, the world doesn't look at it that way because the world looks at it like you're going to be a failure in retirement. You're not going to make it. And so they tell you to pour a lot of money in an IRA, but don't worry, your tax rates are going to be lower when you retire. I am slavishly devoted to the fact that I want to be in the highest tax bracket when I retire, not the lowest, because I want to start accumulating wealth now and have it grow and grow and grow. And I think that I also want to talk to my CP about paying the least taxes, you understand that. But as far as what I'm earning, I want to earn as much in retirement as I, as I do right now actively. And it's a tough goal. Um, we've got a lot of money working. We're uh, a company that's 40 people. And we've kind of grown sort of as the market's grown. We've never had a, uh, a year, praise God, that, that our revenues are lower than the year before and our client base is lower than the year before. Think of us as a bank. We're a bank that holds your IRAs, but you make all the choices. It is self-directed. The reason you need a custodian like NewView is for you to make those choices and keep it tax-free. If you do this yourself at home, you, it, it'll be a withdrawal. You'll have to pay penalties, most of you, and ordinary income tax. The whole concept of this is not paying the taxes as you grow the, um, the accounts. And we're going to talk about the different accounts very, very quickly in a minute. So understand, someone told me about this the, um, earlier this morning. They said, yeah, you know, CDs are earning about 3%, and they kind of are. Now, if you're going to gather money from somebody else, this is generally what the bar that most people are going to ask you to be higher than. So if you're borrowing somebody's IRA, if you can offer them a secured interest in a piece of property and give them 
you're doubling what the marketplace will pay them today. It's not bad. You can lend it for one year, two years, three years, five years. That's up to you. It's between you and the lender. And the lender can be the IRA. It doesn't have to be IRAs. So understand this source of income for you or this source of capital or the source of debt financing is, is pretty interesting. We deal with a lot of lenders in Orlando, and what the lenders in Orlando do is they use other people's IRAs money, they mark it up, and then they lend it out. It's pretty cool, right? Still get a security interest, but they get service fees, they get points, you know. Those are those little things where you charge up front. Sometimes there can be points in the back, and they make pretty good money from it, and they're not using any of their own capital. They're just using their own administrative functions to do it. So that's a little known thing that we do. Here's the types of IRAs. This is not a tutorial. I'll leave that up to the CPAs. I'll give them the microphone if they want to, if they want to have the microphone a little bit later. It's all kind of a lot of stuff that's going to come through your head today, and please jot down a couple of these items. But understand there's four types of IRAs. Two are employer-based IRAs, two are individuals. And so the simples are pretty good for, for companies that have less than 100 employees. So I know Seth has seven employees. You could actually put a, a, a simple plan here. That wouldn't cost too much. And I've talked to all your employees. They think it's a good idea, Seth. So, so we're going to be instituting that after the break. All right. Um, but it's something that, that it's a way to teach people to save, but it doesn't cost the employer much. SEP IRAs are generally for very small companies because the employer has to make 100% of the contributions, and that doesn't generally work for any larger company. So we're left with traditionals, and we're left with Roths. You also have the employer plans. Now, there's one other, one plan I'm going to come back to the uh, Roths and traditionals, but there's a plan called a solo 401k or QRP. Has anyone ever heard of those? All right, so we've got four or five people. But I want to find out here if anyone's eligible for this. How many people have their own business and they're not in an employer's 401k plan, but they have their own business? I know all the realtors should be raising their hands probably. About half this group. You need a solo 401k. I don't need to ask you any more questions. You should look into a solo 401k plan. They're amazing for four reasons. Number one, your contribution limit now in 2019, they've just announced it's about $62,000 if you're over 50, about $56,000 if you're under 50. You can sock away a whole lot of money. By the way, it's all self-directed, so you have all the choices beyond what you would have in, in Wall Street. Second thing is you borrow from it. You know you can't borrow from your own, four, or your own IRA, but you can borrow from your own 401k. That's really cool, especially if you're a realtor or other industries where your earnings go up and down, right? So you have a bad quarter, you can borrow the money, you can pay it back into your plan, you pay it back at prime or prime plus one, and you can borrow it again. So it's almost like having a line of credit, but you're paying back yourself. You also get a determination, you get to put it in pre-tax or post-tax. We'll talk more about that on the Roth side of it. So that's kind of cool. And the last thing is a very esoteric thing, and I'll cover this before I get off stage, and that is that you can actually borrow money inside your IRA to buy real estate. You can leverage your deal. If you do that, you subject yourself to taxes on the profits. And I'm not going to go into detail. Just be aware of that. But here's the hidden secret. If you have a QRP or a solo 401k, you don't have to pay those taxes because it's exempt. It's a written exemption into the 401k rules. 401k, by the way, um, were created. Why do you think they were created? It was created by businesses because businesses wanted to get away from funding your retirement. So he said, hey, this is kind of cool. What we can do is incent it by a little bit of a match or safe harbor match, and we'll get the employees to fund their own retirement, and we'll get out, get out from under it. And it, it only took them about six months after IRAs were created back in 1975 for businesses to figure out, hey, I can create an own subsection of the, of the tax code and actually get employees to do it yourself. So like it or not, that's where we are. We're having to take care of our own retirement. Now, you can take care of your own retirement a couple different ways. You can find someone that's going to manage your money for you, and that's perfectly fine. That's how the world does it, or LS U.S. does it, once you get up to a level where they have an interest, and that generally starts about half a million dollars, and then you have the money guys that will come out and manage your, your funds for 1%. Um, that's okay. But understand that you, you're the one that has control over that. It's up to you on what you want to do. So what I might suggest that you do, and I do this myself, is I take about a half a percent 
of what I have in my retirement, and I spend it on seminars, webinars, traveling, to listen to what other people do with their retirement plans or, or their investments. So invest in yourself. If you have a money guy, that's fine. But you ought, to be, you ought to be knowing what he's doing too or she's doing, not just what you're doing. All right. Oh, let me go back to this. So I promise you to talk about Roths and traditionals. Here's, what's the difference, by the way, on a Roth? Somebody help me. It has to do with taxes. What's the difference? So you pay the tax at the beginning and then later on. So later on you don't have to pay taxes. What kind of crazy scheme is that? That looks like it's tilted in my direction a little bit, right? And none of these tax laws are tilted in the consumer's direction. This is really bizarre because um, this was created. It was uh, actually um, extra bonus points for anyone that can know where Senator Roth came from. Yes, there was a Senator Roth. Anybody? I believe it's Delaware. You can look it up on your, your phone. Maybe it's Maryland or Delaware, I believe. But in any case, it, the idea was people weren't saving, so they wanted to stimulate it. So they, we'll put this out there. A few people will be excited about it. What they didn't understand is the power of this. And I remember reading, once again, the Wall Street Journal. That's a great place to start your morning. Better than the uh, USA Today. Uh, but, uh, but I read about that, and, and there was an article from the editor that said, you know, I'm at this awkward age of 60, and I, now I'm starting to get to know what that guy meant. And the, it was awkward, he says, because half my friends are retired and half of them aren't. And the conversation came up about taxes. And he said, I, I heard more complaining from the people that were retired, and they were wealthy and they were pretty well off, than I ever did the people that were earning money. You can imagine what it's like to work in Manhattan, right? How many taxes do you have? You have city tax, you have county tax, you have high estate tax, and people weren't complaining because they were earning earned income. But when you start living off your, your earnings and uh, your retirement and you get taxed, it hurts worse. And so he decided that he was gonna move his money to a Roth because he didn't like the psychological aspect of being taxed when you're no longer earning money, except passively. So I thought about that and, and there's all sorts of tables you can get to determine whether or not you should move your money from one to the other. Um, and I've decided to do that. So I've, I've been, every year I've been moving uh, enough tax over so I just don't tip that next bracket. And so I've been maybe converting $50,000, $75,000 a, a year, and I'm almost done. So my next, um, I'll do something in December, and I'll be done. So all my money is going to be in Roth. Roths are amazing because, as the young lady here said, you're taxed when the money goes in. So you got a choice. You can either pay tax on the seed or pay tax in the harvest. And I don't know, my plans are, is, are to retire well, God willing, and have a lot of harvesting going on without having to pay taxes. It's amazing that they still give, the government gives us this right. And the government gives us the right to, to actually convert as much or as little as we want every year. That's amazing to me because there used to be a cap on what you earned. If you earned more than $100,000 a year, you couldn't convert at all. And that was lifted by our good friend George Bush during his tax cuts. And it was hidden in there. I don't think too many people understood it. So I'm scared to death that that's going to go away. Like, I'm really afraid that's going to go away. And I got a chance to meet the Undersecretary of the Treasury through an industry group. And I asked him about this. I said, does the government kind of understand what's going on, that they're taking the money now, right? Because they're going to, when you convert, you have to pay taxes on the converted amount. And he said, he said, the government is so hooked on the revenues right now, they don't care about what's going to happen later on. It's amazing, right? So when I hear that, that makes me realize where tax rates are going to go later on. Another reason, right, to convert. It's a personal choice. We do them all. It's up to you. Um, talk to your CPAs. This is really something to talk to your CPA about. But you can do that. How can an IRA be invested? Well, once again, the IRS doesn't say what you can do but uh, I represent a lot of clients that do a lot of interesting things. I don't even want to tell you some of the more bizarre things because it might encourage you to do the same thing, and I, I really don't want to encourage that. And, and you're real estate-based, so we're going to talk primarily about real estate. So there's lots of ways to buy real estate. A lot, uh, real estate, there's lots of ways to structure it. The IRS only says you can't buy two things, and that's life insurance. Now, logically, that makes sense because who is life insurance really supposed to benefit? Your what? heirs, beneficiaries, right? That's not what an IRA is. Think about an IRA as a trust. So it's something that someone else holds, 
New View IRA can hold on your behalf, and it's held for your old age. That's really what it's, what it's meant to be. And that's why there's penalties if you take it out early, right? And, there's, and they force you to take it out after 70 and a half. Why do they force you to take out an IRA after 70? Why? They want their tax money, right? They haven't paid anything yet. But the beautiful thing is, if you're a Roth person, they don't take that at all. All right, so the other element of this is these things, and the IRS is really concerned about the relationship of the parties. So they don't want you doing what they call self-dealing. But it's not just self-dealing. There's, there's a category of people called disqualified people. They're not evil, they're not bad, but they have to do with your transactions within an IRA. Number one person, the number one on, on uh, that list is yourself. So you can't transact with your IRA. And what does that look like? Well, what that basically means, I live in Florida and I get these calls all the time because I used to get them from Miami all the time. And I'd see the 305 area code come up and I knew what was going to happen because it would be somebody wintering down there from New York because you could hear the accent. Said, you know, I heard that I can buy the condo I'm staying in in my IRA and can I do that? And I said, no. Anyone here from New York? Oh. Where? Well, that's even wackier, but no. <laughs> no, it doesn't count. Because Vermonters don't have the same attitude as New Yorkers. So the first thing she says, of course, is, what do you think her next question to me is? Oh, no, no, it's far more blunt than that. It's, how will anyone ever know? <laughs> so can they get away with it? So I explained to him, no, you can't get any beneficial use of anything of your IRA. No more than you could. Let's assume for a moment that your IRA was with Charles Schwab and you owned 1,000 shares of Microsoft. And you're up in the wonderful state of Washington and you thought you'd cruise back, take a look at the company you're invested in. You pull into the employee lot, you park your car and you walk inside and go to the company cafeteria. You don't have the right to do that, right? Even though you're an investor. You can't get a personal benefit from being in the stock market. You can't get a personal benefit just because you happen to be able to buy a nice seaside condominium you can't get a personal benefit from that, too. And there's stories about people that have been caught doing this. But I'm going to digress a moment to say how risky is self-directed IRAs, right? How much are the, uh, is the IRS looking at what you're doing? Does it put you in the target? Does it put you at risk? Well, the only thing I've got to offer on that is the anecdote, which is this. 15 years and probably over 20,000 accounts that we've held during those 15 years, I've gotten one request for data from the IRS. One. Um, so th they were very nice. They said, you know, take two weeks and we'll pay you 15 cents a page <laughs> for all the work we're going to go through to pull it all up. So we're putting people together and grabbing this. This is a brand new thing for us. And uh, about a week before it was due, they sent us a note and said, never mind, we don't need it. We have never sent anything to the IRS for any of our clients. It's never been requested. There are CPAs. It's never been requested to the IRS. So deal with that as you will. But it's a pretty fair indication that nobody's targeting self-directed IRAs. Their attention is elsewhere. And thank God for that because I've got a self-directed IRA that I invest in. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we invest. So the titling is, is critical. Understand that this is how it has to be titled. I talked to someone else earlier about the frustrations that they've had in working with a custodian. And at Newview, we've been trying to make it simple, a lot easier for our clients to do. You understand why the titling's like this? That looks like a trust, doesn't it? The, the initials FBO are up there. That's for the benefit of. So it's being held by one party, which is Newview, for the benefit of the clients and the clients' IRAs. This way that everybody that touches that asset, whether it's a title company um, in the sense of, of real estate, whether it's a loan, basically means there's rules that have to be followed and contact Newview if you want to know what the rules are. Does that make sense? Any questions on what I've done so far? I'm not going to leave all the questions to the end. And by the way, all right, understand that when you buy anything in your IRA, who pays the expenses the IRA? So if you just bought a single family house to rent it out inside your IRA, we understand how it's got to be titled. All the expenses have to be paid out of the IRA, okay? All the income belongs to the IRA. 
The way you get money into an IRA is through contributions, rollovers, or transfers of existing accounts. The way you get money out is only through one way, and that's distributions, right? What you really want to do is hold on to your IRA money as long as you can, because it's the only money that you have generally that's, that's tax-deferred or tax-free in the case of a Roth. Did I mention a Roth is tax-free? That's kind of cool. But you understand that. So, so you don't want to take money out until you have to, and that's why the government had to put that 7 and a half in there, because people weren't willing to take their, theirs out. Um, while you're looking at all those pictures and trying to answer that question, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Seth asked me, say, I said, Seth, what do I talk to these people? Where are they on this? He says, got to cover the basics. And he said, keep it real. Tell them about your own experiences. So I'm going to tell you what I've done in my IRA. And I'm standing up here not as an expert. I'm learning from every one of you and all of my clients. So I had that one piece of property. Um, I watched it go really up. I paid $105,000 for it. And it was a weedy lot, but it was behind a nice gate. And it was about three blocks to the ocean. I couldn't afford the ocean one. That was about 600000 But I got this lot, and every year my IRA had to pay the taxes, right? It comes out. It wasn't earning any income, but it was going up. So you can do land speculation in your IRA. People do it all the time. I've kind of crossed that bridge, and I'm now more into the cash flow, because vacant lots don't cash flow. So maybe what you can do with a vacant lot is, well, you can land bank it if you want. It depends. So I watched it go up for all the way to $260,000. Now, when I say go up, you understand it's esoteric. I didn't sell it, so it's what somebody thought it was worth. You, know, you are realtors, you know, you understand what that means. It's kind of vague. You don't really know until you sell it, how much you can sell it for. So I held on to it. I held on to it for 22 years. I ended up selling it for $103,000. So I had all the taxes. What was my return? Probably minus 25%. But you understand why it was the most valuable purchase I made? It got me in this business. And it got me hooked on this business. And with real estate, you've got to pick yourself off the floor because you understand it's not the sector. It's not the segment that wins or loses. It's the choices within those segments. And I chose to buy something that wasn't going to generate cash flow. So I said, OK, I'm going to, I'm going to start generating cash flow. So I started buying single family rentals, which is where most of us start if we're not flipping. We do single family rentals. And by the way, for those of you that are flipping and you want to do it in your IRA, what I would encourage you to do is do something else in your IRA too, because you don't want to be seen as a dealer. Because if you're seen as a dealer in your IRA, then there's some extra taxes that might be levied on you, and it's going to rob you of gains. So just be aware of that. One way that some of our clients do that is they actually offer a, a rent-to-own program. So if, if if you want to sell it, sell it through that process, and at least if the IRS, in the unlikely event the IRS would be looking at you, they would not see you as a dealer that just flips homes inside their retirement plan. And the reason for this is you don't want to be an operating company of the taxes, but understand the IRS wants you relatively passive in your investments. Now, I kind of laugh about this because you're passive in the stock market. You're not so passive when it's real estate. Right? You decide what you're going to buy. You decide how much you're going to pay for it. You decide on the terms. You decide on the renter. You decide on all of this, the management company, or you can even manage it yourself. So you can, don't have to be that passive with, with real estate, but understand, that, but understand that the IRS doesn't want you running a business inside of it. So I started buying, buying these, and then, and then I realized that I could actually take my HSA. How many people have a health savings account? That's pretty cool. Do you realize that that's probably even better than an IRA? Most people don't treat the HSA in its highest and best use. HSAs are cool because they come with a high deductible health care plan. And I won't go on too much on this because you have to have that plan. I would suggest that when you look at your insurance coverages and if this is available to you, take a look at the high deductible health care plan because you get a savings account attached to it. I can put about $6,800 a year into that plan, which I do. So I have my IRA and I have my HSA and I push as much money as I can into it so that I can do these things that I'm telling you about. So in my HSA, as it got bigger, I got a phone call from the West Coast from my friend Val and he runs a cold storage warehouse. Well, what's that got to do with real estate? Well, nothing, but I want you to understand. He calls me up and he says, Glenn, he says, we have more business and we know what to do with. We have a lot of independent truckers 
that come in. And I got to tell you the story of, of Joe. And he told me the story about Joe and how he'd been laid off. And he's a good guy. And his wife, wife has Parkinson's disease. And it's really sad. And he works hard and all this. And he went to the bank to try to get funding for his truck, for his tractor trailer truck. And he couldn't get it because his credit got ruined when everyone got laid off in 06, 07. So he said, can you lend this guy money out of your IRA? I said, sure, tell me about it. So after that phone call, 30 minutes later, I pulled together a draft of the note and I lent that trucker $40,000 to buy a rig out of my HSA. Is that crazy? Is that risky? Well, it was at the beginning, but not at the end as far as what he signed, because I agreed that I would get all the revenues from him hauling. The first, the first uh, I think it was $800 a month, I would get. So I was the first to be paid. I want to see all his maintenance records. I wanted to be on the pink slip on the truck. I wanted to uh, understand what his contract was with the hauler. I got all this information just to mitigate the risks. So I lend out of my HSA. I learned about a startup company in California. Since I used to um, work out there, that always excites me to be part of all this crazy stuff. Um, and so it's a company that does cell phones. I Somehow I can't get away from cell phones for whatever reason. There's a cell phone battery that attaches to the back and you do all sorts of cool things. So I took $30,000 and invested in that. You can do all of the things that you want to do in the stock market, but you can do it directly with the people that are borrowing, that are, that are uh, involved in the, in the transactions and building the business. So you get a lot more knowledge about what's going on. In Orlando, we're undergoing, has anyone been to Orlando in the last year? Raise your hands. Okay, yeah. I understand it's not necessarily the, the, the tipping point of culture down there, uh, but maybe your kids have drug you down there or whatever. And, and we do appreciate visitors because it means that we don't have any state income tax. You guys don't either, do you? Hallelujah, that's great. I mean, that's phenomenal. And so our visitors pay all of our taxes for us. So we're undergoing a road project, right? Those of you who've been there, you see cones, they're shifting lanes, you never know where you're going. It's called the ultimate. I don't know what the ultimate is, but we're building Lexus lanes. You know what those are? Those special toll roads that can go up and down based on the speed it takes you through town. If you've been in Miami, you know what they are in some other places. But we're building them in Orlando. And we're building a huge, um, what do you call it, roundabout um, part, bypass, beltway? Yeah, there you go. Kind of like Atlanta. We're doing it in or Orlando. We want to be just as crowded as Atlanta. So, but what's happened is those new freeways have created new freeway interchanges. And you know what happens to freeway interchanges, right? Hotels, Walmarts, um, concentrated housing, all of that. So I got a knock on my door from a guy that, that we had done business with, and he says, hey, uh, would you like to invest in, we, we own one of the quadrants, or we control it, or we have sort of option on it. I said, tell me about it. It was really interesting. So I invested in that in my IRA. So I've got that. So I've got, I've got new business startup. I've got the trucker. I've got sort of an LLC that's structuring this deal, but I still love the single family home business. So I started collecting those. And now I'm up to about 10 of those in my IRA, combined with other investments. So my wife has an IRA too. I, hire, I, I hired her into my business, and she doesn't work very hard. She thinks she does. But let me explain what her work is. It's one hour a week. All right? Is that hard? Well, no matter what you're doing, you can hold your nose and do one hour a week. And it's to answer the phones. I mean, that's not that hard. But she works very hard doing a lot of other things, but just not in my business. But it's enough for her to get the full contribution of about $22,000 a year into her IRA. So I'm building her IRA too. So these options are there. So I actually partnered with my wife. She didn't have enough in there to buy a property. So um, we're generating about $1,200 a month on she gets 600 of it. I get 600 of it. So it all gets split up. And we each put the equal amount in. So the partnering... I don't know what my IRA is worth. I didn't kind of sit down and talk about it. I'm less concerned about what it's worth, and I'm more concerned about what it generates. Values can go up and down, but what I want is constant cash flow, constant cash flow. So, you know, everybody has their own goal on what they need to live on. And uh, I love talking to people about retirement. Um, talked to a couple people here today about their retirement. And uh, I love people that are successful in it because people that are successful in it are ready for it. When you hit certain ages, you start to obsess. When you hit age 50, you really start 
to think about your retirement. And you think about, is it going to be there for me when, uh, when I'm there? And how certain is it going to be? I will just tell you that the market and the regular market can't do that for you. Now, here's, what do you think these people have in common? Age. Give me their age. Don't look at your phones. Give me that age. Um, I know you guys all have studied a lot about Mike Pence, right? You must know his age. What age are they? Late 50s. Yeah, they're all between, I think, 57 and 59. That's what your average age of an, uh, the highest income that someone's going to have in their IRA is right around that age. Um, and this is the average age of my client. So at Newview IRA, it's 57. I don't think I have any of those people as clients, but I have sports celebrities as clients, and I didn't put them up there, and I have politicians as clients. I certainly didn't put them up there. I wouldn't want to do. That's their average account balance with us, $178,000. And we, we recognize we own about 40% of their IRAs. So if you're going to look for IRAs, that's when you start looking for older people, all right? Me being one of them. Because we're going to have the highest balances. And don't forget, at my age, I'm still 15, 16 years from having to take a distribution. So that's a long time, and that's the investment horizon that you have. And... Uh, Seth, I'm going to ask you if you would mind uh, passing out those books. i got a few books as I finish up. The best way to go raise money, and I, I think that the highest and best use of my time right now with you as I close, is to really start using other people's money. But other people's money isn't exactly always borrowed. I love to partner. I think everything that I've learned about real estate is I've partnered with somebody. And here's what you've got is you've got the opportunity to take your IRA and marry it to someone else's that knows more about the deals that you do, and you will own your proportional equity interest in your IRA. Does that make sense? So if you want to get to know about tax liens, if you want to invest in multifamily, if you want to just do rentals or you want to do flips, one of the best ways that you can do that is you can actually partner with somebody else. So even when I have enough money to do the deals myself in the IRA, I partner. Because what happens is I always get the best deals. They're always calling me and say, Glenn, will you be in that? I, uh, put me in that for 20%. Put me in that for 40%. And then what I do is I walk around and say, teach me how you evaluate a house. Teach me how you evaluate a neighborhood. And by doing this, now all of a sudden you become an expert and you don't have to partner with them anymore. And make, just make sure that you're titled correctly. Inside those folios, if you flip them open at the very back, there's a page in there, or there's a little slip that you'll see pull out. It's about a postcard, kind of an odd postcard shape. What I'd like you to do is if you want to fill that out, the only thing I'm asking for you is your email. But I have a couple questions for you. Some of you have a IRA. And here's what I'm going to do. You can check those boxes of what you want. You should get on our mailing list, which is simply nothing more than generally one or two things we send to you a month that's going to stimulate you into doing this. All right? The other thing is, is if I get those back, I brought a huge gift over there. Can you unwrap that for the audience? Ooh, okay. So as, as uh, Mr. Mosley is closing up the... Closing up the conversation, what we'll do is any of those slips I get back, I'll ask uh, Seth to draw one, and you'll be the absolute proud winner of this amazing parting gift. Um, I've got about three minutes for questions. Yes, ma'am. Actually, i got more time than that. So, oh, Okay, more time. Yes. Thank you so much, Glenn, for uh, your presentation this morning. I'm curious about the business structure of your company and how you were able to hire your wife? Do you have an LLC? Um, is it a corporation? Are you suggesting it's a bad idea to hire my wife? It probably was, but she's not I here. I don't, I, hopefully she doesn't see this online. Um, I have a business. What, what? I'm going to hire him, Billy. <laughs> Let's put that on record. I'm going to hire my husband. <laughs> well, what's really interesting, with a solo 401k, you can actually hire a spouse and they're covered. So you're good. I'm covered because I actually have a very unique 401k plan that allows me to self-direct. I spend a lot of money creating that structure because I believe my employees should have every right to do what I do. 
So I don't do something off to the side and, and run a business where they can't involve themselves with it. But that's not a structure that I put in place. I have to hire someone else to do that. So it's more a structure of your 401k plan than it is the structure of your business. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's the 401k plan that allows me to do that. Okay, thanks. Yes, gentlemen up front. So if you use your IRA, IRA to invest in real estate and heaven forbid you make a bad investment, what's the process like in a foreclosure? Are you still personally, is that on your personal record just like any other foreclosure would be? Or how does that look if it's inside your IRA? Yeah, well, you're baking in the assumption of foreclosure would mean you'd owe money to somebody. If you bought it cash, of course, there wouldn't be a foreclosure. What you're talking about is if your IRA takes on debt. Right. There and I, I promised to cover that, so I'm glad you had the question. Your IRA can take on debt, but as the gentleman that, uh, who presented up here uh, that was one of the sponsors about um, non-recourse debt? Yeah, if, if your IRA can take on non-recourse debt, what it means is that the asset itself is the protector of the money, not you. So no, if there's a foreclosure on the property and your IRA um, is, uh, is the only asset they can take, they cannot take your money and they cannot ruin your credit because you cannot personally pledge your assets for the loan. And if you go all the way back to that chart, which where we talked about the person on the beach, you cannot establish credit for your IRA. So I can have you know, a 780 or an 800 score if that's pretty good, right? I could have a great score, but if the loan goes bad, I'm not allowed to step in because that would be a prohibited transaction. I'm a disqualified party. So no, it wouldn't affect you. As a matter of fact, it's pretty cool. So. So if you want to borrow money with your IRA, it's a pretty cool idea because you can't get personally hurt. Now, of course, the lender would really like your IRA to pay it back, right? That's the goal, right? Okay. Yeah, if you just stand up, that would be a good Thank indication. Yeah. Um, so I have two completely different questions. My first is going back to your statement of not looking like a business inside, you know, and working in the IRA, the investments you do, making it not look like a business. Is that a statement you made earlier? Yes. Okay, so I have an IRA from a former employer. Since then, if anybody asks me what I do, it, I usually will rattle off that I invest in real estate. Maybe I should or shouldn't if I, I'm using IRA money. Could you money? repeat it? Because I couldn't, if you hold this a little closer. Yeah. So you, if I state that I invest in real estate, just as, as my occupation state, then... Should I avoid using that label if I am using my IRA to invest in real estate? Does that matter? Really? I'm, I'm not sure what label you're referring to. Real I'm, estate investment and using the IRA as... No, okay. no, there's that nothing wrong with real estate investment. All I'm talking about is someone that's... And when we're talking about flipping, we're talking about doing lots of flips. Okay. Five, six, seven a year in there. Okay. That's what gets people's attention, not that you do one a year. That shouldn't put you in the danger zone. Trouble is with the IRS, they never give you the clear indications on what violates that. Right. They just give you some broad ideas. Okay, and my second question had to go back to, or goes back to a statement you made about um, using other people's IRA and they lend out higher and make money on the spread. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I thought about that, known about that, and wondered how, what are they using as security when they're lending out on another, another person's deal. Well, generally, what what that's up to it's up to the parties. One of the things that may surprise you is that you can actually lend your money unsecured. How many think that's a great idea? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, understand that you know, other than breaking kneecaps and stuff, that's about all you'd have. So generally, what happens in those deals when people are writing big checks to or asking me to write big checks out of their IRAs to somebody, they're going to want a first deed of trust or mortgage deed on that property. So they would actually be, the IRA, the IRA would be the owner of that secured interest in the property. So you'd give them a security, just like a bank would get security. Sure. The individual lender would have that security. Okay, but I'm in the middle putting the deal together. Yeah. And so where, I'm just wondering how I, <laughs> how it know, all works. How am I getting paid in the middle there? Well, you're going to get paid in the work. You're going to get service fees. You're going to get points. It's all part of lending. Now there's going to have to be rules and regulations within your state on how you're going to have to structure that. That's where you need to go back to somebody that's really knowledgeable about how that works if you're here in Tennessee. And so you want to be, you want to make sure that you're not 
seen as a security, providing a security, and all of those types of things. So that's where you'd have to discuss with your lawyer. As far as the IRS and the IRA goes, all of that's possible, though. Hi, Glenn. Hey. How are you doing? Uh, I was just wondering if you could touch on for a minute ways to potentially avoid the unrelated business income tax inside of a solo 401k, or is that different than inside of an IRA? And do you have to do like offsetting losses in order to avoid that, or what? What is your thoughts on that? Well, uh, there's two taxations that can happen inside an IRA. One is unrelated business income tax, and that's generally in regards to running a business. We talked about that, and that's why you don't want to do flips. It's not illegal to do flips, but you could pay a tax that ratchets all the way up to 38% on the gains, right? The other part is unrelated debt financed income. Now, I'm starting to get pointy-headed here, and it's, I, I don't want to take, go too far deep into that. Um, there's really no way to avoid UBIT, unrelated business income tax, because you are in a corp. You, if you're in that, you have to pay the taxes. When it comes to debt, if you're having debt-financed income, if, once again, if you're inside a 401k, it doesn't apply. So you don't have to worry about it at all if you're in that structure. Um, if, you're, if you're outside that structure, um, then what's going to happen is as long as you have the debt retired 12 months before you sell it, then there is no tax on it. You can 1031 exchange that to another property, and I, that's, a, that's a whole other seminar, but you've probably had people come in and talk about that. But you can 1031 exchange that basis into another property and do it that way. Those are the only two ways. And don't forget that you get to take away all the expenses of holding that property, so your tax may not be that big. I will tell you this. If you're, going to do, if you're going to do these deals and take on debt, it's usually cheaper and a higher rate of return if you take on debt and do it yourself than if you partner. So understand that the worst it's going to get is you have to pay 38% of the gain of the portion that you borrowed. That's it. Versus if I 50-50 do a 50-50 with a partner, I've got to lose 50% of my deal. So you understand that talk to your lenders in this room and talk to sellers that are doing, that can self-finance. I know a couple deals, I'm going into a, a warehouse, a storage warehouse things. Those things are like minting money, some of them. You can find, you talk about cash flow, that's all about cash flow. And the owner wants to get out of the business and uh, so he's willing to finance it because he wants a retirement income over 10 years. Oh, that's perfect, right? And I can control, and he doesn't care about the risk of, of interest rates. So I can lock in the interest rates now, which keep going up. That's pretty cool. So understand that having debt on it isn't something you should avoid. It's just something you should be aware of before you do it, what the costs are. All right, so we're going to go on the investor side of things here, um, not necessarily lender side, because that's, that's very difficult to lend inside the, uh, find lending on the inside of the, uh, the, the 401ks and IRAs. So personally, so I'm looking at several deals here that I need some funds for. And I want to come to, you know, people that have these self-directed IRAs and solo 14Ks to, to use their funds and put them into play. And this is a broad brush, um, you know, a question here. But on average, what are you seeing for returns for those, those people that are on the debt side or the equity side? Well, professional lenders, you can, yeah. you can yeah. tell me what you charge. Um, I think, you know, the less sophisticated or the people that aren't in the business, I mean, their starting point is the 3%, right? Yeah. Uh, it depends how much interest rate risk they're taking. What I mean by that is how long the loan's for, right? Because if in a one-year plan, your the interest aren't, rates aren't going to change much in a year, but a five-year or a 10-year balloon or whatever that is, then the interest rates are out there. What I'm seeing is I see a bunch of 5% stuff, 6% stuff. And it amazes me because I think their money's worth more than that, but I don't advise or counsel them. And I, I think when you talk to friends and family and, well, be careful about the family because of yeah. the disqualified parties. But the people that you associate with, they don't like, the market right now is at an all-time high. We've had so many all-time highs, right? Question is, do you want to buy at the all-time high? Another little secret, by the way is that with self-directed IRAs, I never pay retail for anything. And if I'm in the stock market, I pay retail for everything. You understand? I pay it based on millions of sellers and millions of buyers, and that sets the market. It's a very good capitalistic uh, business, but I want an advantage over that, and that's why I don't do that. Um, I don't know if I answered your question or not. It's, it tends to be 5 or 6%. The people that are doing this and are wanting to draw a lot of money out of IRAs tend to pay between 8 to 10%. 
<laughs> that, that's kind of one of the things as far as deal structure that we've seen for our, our syndications and, and MES uh, funding for the deals. But it's personally what, you know, some of these smaller deals that are more class A type stuff, you're looking, you know, five, five to six percent is about all you can really give on a, on a two, two to three year deal. So I would make sure they weren't expecting, expecting more, you know, with, with, your, with your clients that you've seen. Yeah, I mean, generally, we see syndications. I don't know if any of you have been involved in syndications. I, get, I have to speak in front of lots of groups that syndicate. But what we see is the Class A tenants, you know, like the CVS Pharmacy and the public supermarkets. I don't know if you have those up here. But the people that have been around a long time, that's about what, what those syndications are looking like, a return of about 5 to 6%. And the cap rates are coming down. I mean, they really are coming down. They're going to collide pretty soon because what's happening is interest rates are going up. So we'll start to see a reversal of that. But people are absolutely giddy with excitement to get 6% on their IRAs. They are. Most people are. And the more sophisticated you are. I, I got a chance to speak to a group in Belize, and it was a very interesting group because they were all um, highly uh, high net worth people. So they, they had incomes and of you know five five six hundred thousand dollars a year and, and uh, net worths of ten ten million dollars plus. And they all look like us. They had all the anxieties that we have. Having all that much money doesn't help your life if you're not solid without it. But the one thing I will tell you is they wouldn't get up in the morning and look at an investment unless it was 12%. The reason why is they see those deals all the time. And once you start self-directing, you'll start seeing those deals all the time. And all of a sudden, it's going to rise what you expect out of your money, and that's the exciting part of it. I want to borrow 6% and get 12% return. That's where I was going with it. <laughs> Well, I see you know, with 15s. here's what I believe. I, I, I don't care what you make, what you mark mine up with, with, as long as I'm happy with my return. So that's all you have to be worried about. I don't think you need to be greedy. It's, a, it's up to you. I mean, the best way to build a business is that you can make great money on 2%. Because don't forget that you're not putting any of your own risk on it, right? It's everybody else's money. So get that 10 million, that 20 million, that 30 million r rolling, and you can really do it. Question: You mentioned the 401, the solo 401k. Yes. Being able to borrow from it is that like a? Could you talk about that a little bit? Is yeah, that you're able to borrow. You're able to borrow up to fifty thousand dollars or fifty percent of your, of the amount that you have in there, whatever's less. Oh, so if you had a hundred thousand dollars, you can borrow it. Has to be paid back within five years, ten years if it's your first purchase of real estate in it. But generally, the best thing to do is borrow from it, pay it down and then borrow from it again. So, it's, so it always remains a viable thing. And there's no cost to it. There's no fees to it. It's just basically all the interest that you pay, you pay back to yourself. Okay, so you can use it like a line of credit? It's exactly what it is. Yeah, okay, so you it's a line of credit and you're the bank. Okay, and so it's up to 50,000 is the max? Yes. Okay, and can you transfer like some money from a SEP over to? Absolutely. Perfect. All the, t the only thing that can't roll into a solo 401k, believe it or not, is a Roth. Everything else can roll into it. Okay. Are you married? Yes. There's another $50,000 you could borrow. If oh. she has one, too. So that's yeah. pretty cool. But she has a Roth, so you can't roll it over? Can't roll that uh. over, no. Oh, I was just going to ask about the criteria you mentioned for a solo 401k. Um, if you own your own business, right? Yes. But if you have rentals, vacation rentals, you know. Perfect. Real estate property that it generates 200, 300,000 in rentals, but it's passive income. So does that count as? Here's all you gotta do. Okay. This isn't complex. I think the gentleman right behind you can create a business around what you just said. Someone has to manage it. That manager needs to get paid reasonable compensation. The IRS demands that. So whatever it would take to manage it, maybe it's 40,000, maybe it's 60,000 or 70,000. So you have to have W-2 income, right? So that's the stuff you pay Social Security and Medicare on. Once you have that, that makes you eligible, okay? And that it can be a solo, so, sole proprietorship. You don't have to create an LLC around it or any of that. So it sounds to me like you're doing the work. You're just not compensating yourself. So you're going to have to start compensating yourself. Okay, I think the issue is, is you, to contribute to the self-directed IRA, you're going to need Schedule C income, something that's subject to self-employment tax, or you're going to have to go with an S-corp structure where you pay yourself a reasonable compensation. And then you would pay a management fee from your rental properties into the S-corp. Then the S-corp would pay you a W-2 wage. The one challenge we have in Tennessee is we have a franchise and excise tax. So on the S-corp, you're probably going to wash, want to wash out your income. But just 
when, you, when you're talking about the solo K plan, what's going to happen is you're going to be able to contribute based on your W-2 wages, and then the S Corp, which is also you, can make an employer match contribution based on limitations. So you're able, you will be able to minimize that, what we call the FICA tax exposure. Um, we have to, with the, with the, um, the, the company match is going to offset that. So, and also with tax reform right now, there's a lot of, there are a lot of strategies for qualified business income deductions and that sort of stuff. But, um, so yeah, there's a, there's a, if, if your W-2 wages are too high, then the Social Security tax will start eating away at that. But you're right. It, it, that's why we have CPAs in the room here, because it becomes a very much a, a personal question to you on what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Uh, so I think I have more of a, just a really basic question. Starting from the beginning, you know, we said uh, there are people in here that like their day job. If you like your day job, you work at a company that has a 401k or maybe a 403b, I'd like to hear if there are any differences with those. Um, uh, what are the opportunities for, uh, it sounds like a lot of the opportunities you're talking about here are in those self-directed or sort of uh, per personal 401k plans. So what are the rules around, uh, around that? Are you able to do these same kind of things out of the standard 401k or 403b that a regular company would do, or do you need to roll those over? So if you work for the grand old Opry, right, and I imagine they have employees and all of that kind of stuff, and they probably have a 401k plan. And uh, so the question is, what choices do you have when you're in that plan? I'll, I'll have to tell you, one of the things that you got to do is, is, is get older. Because one of the things that... These plan documents are individual by each company. And who writes the plans documents? It tends to be Wall Street writes them. So it's tilted away from the employer. It's also tilted away from, from the employee. It's really uh, somewhat of a bastardization about why it was created in the first place. It should be all about the employees. So what the employers do is because... The fund managers and Wall Street are writing these plans. They make them very restrictive. So you can't do a lot of this stuff, right? They may even give you only four, five, six choices on what you can invest in. It's very limiting. But a lot of these plans will also allow you, once you hit certain ages, like 50, to take an in-service distribution. Then you roll it out into a, 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 not a solo 401k because you're already covered, but it has to be an IRA. So you can roll it into an IRA. So all of you that are working in day jobs, first of all, go back to this is kind of a funny story, but go back to your employer and say, I want to take money out, but I don't want to quit working here. Tell me how I can do that. Force them to understand that you as an employee, you love their plan, whether it's a company match generally is, but having that plan in there, the money in there is very restrictive. So it's not where you want to leave it. So if you go talk to them, I've had actually people that took a leave of absence for two weeks, took the money out and rejoined their employer. You understand? Just to get the money out. So based on the size of your employer, they don't understand the plans. They don't understand it like you do. By coming here today, you kind of understand the power of doing something outside of it. You have to talk to your employer to do that because they're the ones that are restricting you. It's not us in our world. We're, we're saying we got the catcher's mitt. We're ready for all, everything that comes at us, and we want to give you the freedom. But yes, it can be limiting if you have a day job. But you can still, you can still put money in your in your Roth and your traditional, in addition to your, to your other uh, contributions. Can you say a few words about the custodial fees? Ah, what does it all cost? Service? Yeah, it's a theory until we start talking about what it costs. Well, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to explain what it costs based on my first acquisition that I did uh, with the bank in LaSalle Bank. To do that same transaction, a piece of property in your IRA, it's going to cost you $50 to open your account. It's going to cost you $95 to get that titled and do all the work with the title company to get it titled correctly. And then it's $295 a year we hold it. And for that, we do all the tax filings. For that, you're invited to all of our client events, all of our webinars, and you get to hang around a community that's amazing. So all of that's included in the $295 a year. That's what it's going to cost. And uh, it cost me $2,000 with the bank the first year and $1,000 a year after. And we haven't changed our fee structure in seven years, eight years, I think. I've forgotten the last time. Got a question from Janice online. She oh. asks, does Glenn sit down with people and personally answer questions and give monetary advice? I do. I, I don't know where she's located. I'm happy to do that. So it might take a plane fare or something to go, and I don't, I don't know. Um, I do travel a lot. 
I, I don't know if you can um, you can find out where she's located. In uh, in Orlando, we actually have coffee with the CEO, and I did this two days ago, and we invite people to come in. Sometimes there's one person, sometimes there's eight or nine people. So yeah, and, but understand that I, I run the company which makes me the least informed of anybody. I mean, we have great, great people in our organization. You don't have to come to the gray-haired guy. There's lots of great people that are fully knowledgeable about what we do, what we do. and we'll do, it by, uh, we'll do it by phone, and if you want to see us, we'll do it by FaceTime, right? Is it called FaceTime? I've got to ask all these people here. FaceTime, we'll do it that way, so we're happy to do that. Very cool. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll have her post. Uh, time for one more question. Anybody else got anything? Awesome. Let's give a big hand for Glenn Mather. And we hey, thanks for learning with us today on the show. We would love to meet you at one of our free monthly meetups in Middle Tennessee. Hit the thumbs up button if you like the content. Make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss a thing on this channel. Check out another awesome investing video here.